this particular topic about uh, Land of Big Caves Lodge 405, uh, some of you I know are not OA collectors uh, that are on here or were at one time or know something about it. Um, but uh, Lodge 405 is an interesting lodge for OA collectors, uh, but not for the usual reasons. You know, uh, when it comes to important lodges in the Order of the Arrow, we think of Unami, of course, is important. We think of Owasapi as important. And in your particular area or region, usually one of the earliest lodges from your area got Order of the Arrow started in your part of the country. And, and they became a, a central lodge. I know out on the West Coast for us, it was Lodge 90 Canalino that started in, in 1936. And that got uh, California going with the OA from that point on. But Lodge 405 is interesting to collectors. It was a very, very small lodge. It wasn't around for very long. And it wasn't one of these early lodges or important lodges. Um, so it's really quite by uh, coincidence I would say. It's one of those lodges that didn't issue much as a lodge. And if you were a patch collector or a number collector, as it used to be called starting in the, in the late fifties and then for quite a number of time, a uh, number of years, if you wanted a patch from Lodge 405 to fill out that part of your number set, uh, you didn't have a whole lot to choose from. And uh, so a story developed around Lodge 405. They never did issue a flap. Uh, everyone's in agreement on that. But as number collectors tried to fill in their number sets going all the way back to the late 1950s and into the early 60s, 405 was one of those numbers they couldn't get anything from because there didn't seem to be anything to get. And it was on everybody's needs list. Uh, I picked up my very first Lodge 405 patch in 1968. So that's going back a ways. And I remember as a kid, when I got it, I was a teenager. And when I got it, I was just thrilled to get a, a patch from Lodge 405. And um, never really knew the story. Years went by, different things were, were added and subtracted from the story of Lodge 405 along the way. It was all interesting. Nobody seemed to care all that much about it. And um, then as the listings evolved and, and then um, getting involved, I remember getting involved with Blue Book. And on this, on this very broadcast, we have, uh, we have uh, Johnny, we have uh, Rob Cutts, we have Roy Weatherby. Uh, these were uh, some of the great collectors still around today that were involved in the resurrection of the Blue Book Project. Uh, uh, in the past, we've had uh, Albertus Hugovin on uh, with the, and of course, he was involved with the Arapaho Project. And so with the Blue Book Project, uh, I got more interested in cataloging in general, and things like Lodge 405 were left to the regional editors. Uh, because I didn't have I didn't have any personal knowledge about it myself, living across the country. So, the years have gone by. Different things have happened, and different resources have become available to us that we didn't have when I started collecting. We have more cataloging lists. We have a greater continuum. We have Craig on the line uh, uh, as we speak, who's uh, keeping our listings alive and uh, keeping them as accurate as he can, utilizing uh, the resources that were available and have been available and continue to be available to him. So this whole issue of 405 was always a question mark in my mind. And I started to look into it and part of the story started to crack open uh, when it became easier to uh, research newspaper articles. And like newspapers.com, which is an incredible resource for everyone here on, on the uh, in listening shot of what we're talking about right now. And uh, back in the day, uh, Boy Scouts got more news coverage uh, for little things than they get today. They still get new news coverage today, as we all know, but it's usually only bad news and for major, major bad news. But 
in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, um, most small newspapers and small town newspapers had reporters that covered, they would once a week or once every other week would swing by the scout office, see if there was a story to put into the local paper. And the stuff that's in the newspapers that's accessible to us on our computers in our living rooms today is just off the chart in terms of what we had available when I was first collecting and even, even just 20 years ago. So we're gonna see some of that stuff. So let's go ahead and, and start to take a look at Lodge 405 for, for a minute here. Now, uh, for those, many of you are familiar with this part of the country in Kentucky. Uh, you know where some of these places are. I'm on the other coast. And for those of us that uh, don't know all that much about Kentucky and the councils in Kentucky, uh, you can see here on the map that Lodge 405 was centered out of Bowling Green and the council was Mammoth Cave Council. So within these council boundaries uh, for the council and the lodge were a number of very small cities. Bowling Green was the biggest city in this area, uh, a very rural area, kind of Appalachian-y. If you're from that part of the country, that may not be 100% accurate, what I just said, uh, but you know it's in a rural area. And I think the population of Bowling Green in the 1950 census was about 4,500 people in the entire town. And that was, that was the large town uh, in that council. And that was where the council office was. It was also where Mammoth Cave National Park is located. And a lot of us uh, are familiar, some of us have been there. Uh, Mammoth Cave is, is uh, considered even today to be the largest cave network uh, on the planet, anywhere. And it gained quite a bit of notoriety and was a tourist attraction. There were some other councils around this area, just to put things in perspective, bordering uh, Mammoth Cave Council was Audubon Council, once upon a time called Western Kentucky Council before it broke up. And Mammoth K and, um, excuse me, uh, Audubon Council uh, was centered in Owensboro, uh, Kentucky, in Northwest Kentucky. Mammoth Cave Council involved about 14 counties and uh, two counties in Northern Tennessee, actually. Uh, there, were a couple, there are a couple of other areas just to put things in perspective that become relevant to us. Um, the other bordering council uh, is the big council in Kentucky, Louisville. And that's where uh, the oldest lodge in Kentucky is. And the probably the most, I guess in some fashion, the most significant uh, of all the OA lodges in Kentucky, uh, Zid Kalashaw in that area. And some, some really big time collectors came out of that council, including in the late 50s, mid to late 50s, and in the 60s, one of the biggest collectors um, of the time in the era and still influential today. And that was Hal Rudd. Many of you are familiar with him. Some of you met him. And of course, uh, his son, Bob Rudd, became one of the most significant collectors of our current time over the last 20 or 30 years. Uh, the final council I want to highlight, uh, because they're all kind of in proximity, is up over here in northern Kentucky, bordering Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, you have the council where, uh, Dan Beard Council, where Lodge 155 was located. And 155, uh, of course, is a, a significant lodge to us as collectors because they had a patch. And the patch is hard to get. And if you want something from that name, you got to get that patch. And that's just the way it is. Um, 155 as a lodge started in 1939, I believe. But by World War II, it had gone inactive and was inactive a lot of the time and only became resurrected around 1955 or 56 for just a few short years. And that's when their, their patch came out. So that's kind of the lay of the land. When it comes to Lodge 405, here are the questions um, that I think uh, we as collectors want to know today. We want to know how did this lodge start and how did it end? What are the actual circumstances? Because a lot has been written 
and we're not too sure about some of it. We want a current understanding of a Lodge 405 in the hobby today. What's the current recording of an, an information that we have? So we'll take a look at that. Uh, we want to know the history and the, cr the chronology of the Lodge name for 405, because it's not one name, it's two names that we're familiar with. And what's the story with those two names? And then we want to know about Lodge insignia. As patch collectors, this is our main focus and uh, what, uh, what gets us going. So we need to take a look at that. These are the questions I hope to answer. Now, I want to talk for a minute about evidence and how we make some of the decisions that we make. Uh, when I was involved with the uh, genesis of Blue Book in 1996, um, there was a lot of discussion about how does information get into Blue Book? And what are the criteria for that discussion? One of the, one of the most interesting topics is one of our members on the phone right now, uh, Rob Cutts wrote the section on how do, you, how do you tell the difference between issues and varieties? And that was the first time that that had ever been done, uh, particularly on a national level. And that's an interesting story, Rob. Uh, I know you're there. I'd like to see you talk more about that story sometime in your own presentation in front of the group of how you wrote those articles and how you came to the conclusions that you came to. And looking back on it now, 25 years, um, what would you do that's the same? What would you do that's different now that you have a little perspective on it? But part of it, good evidence for what we want to record has to do with actual records from the National Order of the Arrow Office. And we have access to some of those records from the national secretaries over the years. We'll see some of those. Uh, another good aspect of, of evidence is contemporaneous newspaper articles. Like I talked about earlier, things get written in the papers while they're happening. There's no bias. There's no strangeness. There's no, no people with an agenda when a reporter goes in and writes an article in 1950 on a Boy Scout meeting. And so it's pure information. Uh, sometimes there's mistakes in it, to be sure. But it's, it's not because someone's trying to uh, uh, play shenanigans of some type. And then we have the lodge listing insignias. Uh, the lodge insignia listings, I mean, starting with the WAB book, and then we have the Lodge Listings books from the 60s that were called, uh, we call them blue books. They actually call them Lodge Listings books in the day. We'll take a look at some of those. We have a Arapaho 2. And of course, we have OAinsignia.com, which uh, keeps, uh, keeps the story alive of how uh, we catalog order the arrow patches. And then patches themselves that are known to the hobby they become evidence in their own way, uh, whether they're uh, whether legitimate patches, whether they're questionable, whatever they are, they are they're actual physical things, and um, they're evidence in their own way. Uh, there's some things that we like to de-emphasize when we talk about the word evidence, and that falls into the category of hearsay and unverifiable or undocumented accounts from third party sources. And we hear this all the time. Um, how often do we hear, well, an old timer in my lodge said this, or a past chief said that. And it's all verbal, there's no names attached, there's no written record of it. And it's basically either hearsay or unverifiable. It's out there. This type of stuff's been going on for over 50 years, 60 years, as we'll see. But we like to de-emphasize this type of evidence in favor of better evidence that's actually written down or photographed or what have you. Now, our discussion with Lodge 405 starts, can start anywhere, but it starts here. Um, May 16, 1948, the council decided to change its name and it changed its name from, I'm not, I don't know if I'll pronounce this right. I'll give it a go. Uh, uh, Kojioba Council. That was its name when it got started out. And in 1948, it changed its name to Mammoth Cave. And so that probably had something to do with the fact that Mammoth Cave 
became a national park in 1941. And so the council wanted to play off the fact that the area in its council, this was really the main attraction. And they went ahead and changed the council name at that particular time. Later in that year, October 1st, it's reported in the, in the paper, the Park City Daily News, which was the largest paper in the council area for um, uh, Bowling Green and Park City and Glasgow. And if we take a look at this, we see some interesting stuff on October 1st, 1948. That's just mind boggling stuff. It says that um, a lodge for Mammoth Cave Boy Scout Council, Order of the Arrow, was formed on Thursday night at a dinner meeting at the Dixie Cafe. Now, that would be cool. I, I, I would like to go to the Dixie Cafe in Bowling Green or where, you know, that would be a fun thing to do. But they decided to form a lodge and campers were chosen from various summer camp periods from 1948. Now that's right after they changed the name of the council. And then it goes on to say, if we move down to the middle over here, you can see it says, the name selected for the lodge was Great Caves, Great Caves, and the totem is the bear. Uh, now, for those that are following along with the cataloging, we know that the name Great Caves never shows up in any listing. It's not in Blue Book, it's not in Arapaho, it's nowhere, it's not in on oaimages.com. It's, it's just not there. Uh, another form of the name is there, but that name is not there. And then let's take a look at the bottom here, because this is important. At the bottom, the application for a charter will be approved by the council executive board at its meeting on December 16th. Now, it's okay that a bunch of scouts, maybe staff guys from the camp, it's okay that they had dinner at the Dixie Cafe and decided to form an OA lodge, but everyone on, on, on uh, this uh, listening to this right now knows you're not really an OA Lodge just because you decided to be one at the Dixie Cafe. You're an OA Lodge when your council submits, approves and submits an application to the scouts for a charter for the Order of the Arrow. So it was a little bit, a little bit premature that these guys were calling themselves a Lodge but okay, it's 1948. This is the kind of stuff that happened along the way. On December 29th, the charter for the lodge actually comes through. For me to be able to see a newspaper article like this, that a lodge charter comes through, who was involved, who were the officers, all that stuff. To see this in the newspaper when it actually happened, this is, this is like hitting the jackpot um, as far as I'm concerned. And take a look, they recently organized Order of the Arrow at Mammoth Cave Council and it received its official charter. That would be sometime close to December 29th, 1948. And the chapter, if we look down here in the second red bubble, the chapter will be known as Land of the Big Caves. So they went from Great Caves uh, at the Dixie Cafe. And by the time they got their charter, they were Land of the big caves and the totem is to be the bear. I found it interesting that they decided in 1948 that only eight scouts would be selected from summer camps each year. So this was a lodge that was, it was a small lodge. There was hardly anyone that lived in this council, very rural area, but they started out only willing to accept eight scouts per year as members of their lodge. Uh, we don't do it that way now. We haven't done it that way in a long time and most lodges never did it that way. Now, nothing much happened after that in the newspapers uh, until 1950, when we start to see some articles that Mammoth Cave Boy Scout Council is in danger of being disbanded because it does not have money. The scout executive, Bennett D. Taylor Jr., who was the, the council executive, was putting out the alarm. They were having trouble raising money to keep the council going. And now this is in the springtime of 1950. So you got a very small council, 
not geographically, but very small in terms of the number of scouts in it. And now they don't have the dough to keep going and they're in danger of losing the council. And this bubble on the bottom I thought was interesting. The majority of the indebtedness, according to the scout exec, is for back rent, office expenses, and salaries. They didn't have enough, to. they hadn't been paying the rent, they didn't have enough to pay rent, and they didn't have enough for salaries. Now in a small council like this, who were the salaries? You had the scout exec, you had a, maybe a district exec, and you had the secretary. And they were in danger of not getting paid. So now we advance forward to 1951, October 31st. There are newspaper articles in the middle about a Boy Scout campaign to raise money. But on October 31st, they're announcing of 1951, they're, they're announcing that they need 4,700 bucks to keep the movement going. And the fundraising drive is practically at a standstill, as they say. They've raised about 2,500 out of 4,700 and there's no more money coming in. So this is a council that's in trouble. Why do we wanna know this? In part, because we, we've all been involved with councils or maybe we have or we haven't, but we're aware of them, that they're having trouble uh, raising funds and uh, nothing, get, nothing happens. The camp doesn't get improved. Uh, things don't get bought. And um, some of these councils of course have to merge. So this. This was the lay of the land here for Mammoth Cave Council, right at the time that Land of Big Caves Lodge started. We see this article on November 11th, 1951. This is, this is part of a bigger article on a Boy Scout news report. And part of it, when you look at the bubble on the bottom, it says the Order of the Arrow held a conference on October 26th, 27th and 28th at Glasgow Rotary Scout Reservation. And then on the upper right, it goes on to talk about how many people were there from Bowling Green. It was to, it was to take on new members. They had four, only four members from the largest city in the council were coming into the lodge that year in 1951. And only one past member from Bowling Green attended the conference. Now that's a small conference. We're talking maybe they had a dozen, maybe they had 20 Order of the Arrow members that attended that conference in 1951. But amazingly, they put out a patch. And this is the patch. They made this patch. It was for the conference. The conference is documented as a lodge event contemporaneously in 1951. And you gotta wonder, for a council that doesn't have any money, where did they get the money to put out a patch? Now, patches were not super expensive, certainly by today's standards, but if you don't have any money in your council, you don't have money for patches. Now, in the, back, in, in the, in the old days, you could buy a half run or even a quarter run of patches. A run of patches on a Swiss loom was typically 220-ish patches. You could buy a half run, maybe 110, and, and you could even buy a quarter run of about 50 patches. I don't know how many patches they ordered. I don't know how many patches they needed, but it's hard for me to imagine that they ordered more than a quarter run or 50 patches, but this patch is pretty well documented. And then the bad news comes in, the scout exec resigns on March 10th, 1952, after being there for three years. And he takes a position, get this, he takes a position from as an, an assistant scout exec in another council. So he resigns being a scout exec to take a position, a lesser position as an assistant in another council. Why does a scout exec do something like that? Well, we don't know for sure, but one of the possible reasons is because he wasn't getting paid. And so at the bottom of the article, we see Mr. Taylor's successor in the council has not been chosen. So all of a sudden the scout council doesn't even have an operating council exec. And then on November 9th, 1952, it's announced that the council 
is dissolved and it's merged with Audubon Council with headquarters in Owensboro, Kentucky. So that was the neighboring council to the north. That was where Lodge 367 Wapiti was located. And that everything was gone by November 9th, 1952, when, when this announcement came down. So that was the story. Wasn't around very long, 1949 to 1952, and then gone. Let's take a look. Let's change gears and take a look at some national records of what happened during that time. Now these national records, these cards were cards held in the national office, started in 1951, probably as a result of the 1950 NOAC. The national office at BOSA wanted to keep better track of all the lodges and the lodges, the OA was expanding tremendously in the late forties. New lodges, new everything, they were losing track of it. They came up with this handwritten system of developing a card and then they would write in information about members and so on. We're looking at this card here from Wapiti Lodge that started in 1947, Audubon Council, Lodge 367. This card and the image of this card is courtesy of our uh, good collecting friend, Bill Topkis, who had access to all of these cards and their images. And they tell us a record that was going on. And we can see from 1951 to 1961, the national secretary or the secretary of the secretary would write in the name of the chief, the new members, the cumulative total and so forth. Now, if we take a look up here at the top of this card, we can see this funny thing right here next to the word Wapiti. That funny thing up there is a staple. Well, what's the big deal? Why would there be a staple? And that's because there was a card stapled to the back of this card when it was located. It was this card right here. This yellow card was stapled to the back of the Wapiti Lodge 367 card. And this was the card for Lodge 405 in the national office. In 1951, they don't have an entry for 1951, except for on the very right-hand side, 20 members cumulative. Let's take a better look at that. We can see 20 members cumulative for 1951. And then the national, the secretary to the national secretary wrote in for 1952, this lodge merged with 367 Audubon Council. And that's verified information. They also list the charter date up here this looks like a three to me, one, three, nine. I'm not sure why that's there. That's not when this lodge was chartered. It was chartered in December of 1948. And so their first charter year was 1949. Maybe that's a typo. I don't know what, what's going on with that. The name of the lodge was Land of Big Caves. And that's the national record. I asked Bill, uh, when I got these images from him uh, and I said, hey, Bill, how come this card is yellow and the lodge for uh, Wapiti Lodge is white? What did that mean? And Bill said, well, quite simple. At the time that they created the card system, they used a yellow card for lodges that were chartered but did not send in their charter dues that year and the year being 1951. Well, we already saw previously, the council was running out of money and the council didn't have, you know, a lecture. I don't know how much it cost, what the dues were to send in for your OA charter each year. But back in the day, it was probably $20 or less, but the council just didn't have the money. So they didn't send in the charters, plain and simple. The charter renewals, I should say, their large number was reserved but they were not chartering. Also, what we note here, at the point that Lodge 405 merged, there was no evidence, either in any newspaper article or in the national records, no evidence at all that this lodge ever went by any name other than Land of Big Caves, except for what happened at the Dixie Cafe in 1948, 
when the guys that wanted the charter just called the lodge Big K's. But other than that, there was no other name for this lodge. Interesting. We need to, we need to dig into that for just a second. Now, let's take a look at oainsignia.com and how this lodge is listed today online. Went to oainsignia.com, one of my favorite sites. Thanks, Craig, for keeping this alive and pulling it all back together again uh, after the big snafu, computer crash, whatever the deal was. Um, and, and, and that is, is now uh, our record of what we got. And we go to Lodge Lookup, we put in Lodge 405 and we get two entries, 405A, Land of Big Caves, and we get Lodge 405B, which is Walla Elema Mikaki. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, but that's the way I protect, uh, uh, pronounce it. These are what we see today. You can go on right now and you can see, and these are the historic names for the lodges. This was in Blue Book, this was in Arapaho. This is a historic listing that um, uh, has had very little change over the years. Let's take a look at these for a second. Lodge 405A, Land of Big Caves. Now we have the word the written in there, Land of the Big Caves. Uh, the national records call it Land of Big Caves. Who knows? The, I don't know if that should be part of it or not. But we see it has zero listings for Land of Big Caves. And we know that was the name of the lodge. We've seen the proof from the national office. And so when we look for regular issues, we look for events, we look for chapters, and we look for pending issues for Land of Big Cave Lodge, and there's nothing, zero, no listings for Land of Big Cave Lodges. Let's go ahead and take a look at the listing itself. Ch chartered in 1949, Lodge Totem is a bear. That's correct. We know that from contemporaneous information. Let's now go and take a look at changes. 1950, change name to Walla Elama Mikaki. Really? Hmm, where'd that come from? We know in the national records, it didn't change its name. We know in contemporaneous news articles, it didn't change. So what's that all about? We'll have to find out more. Let's go to the next listing. This is 405B, Walla Ella Mikaki. And when we take a look at this lodge, we see that it has six listings for 405B, Walla Elamem Khaki. And of course, the number one item is R1. R1, this wonderful round patch with a bear on it and red rolled edge, white, red. And then it says, issued by lodge members shortly before official merger in 1953. Now, that little piece of notation showed up uh, before OAinsignia.com, before OA Blue Book, um, but it showed up somewhere along the way. We're going to have to take a look at that and see what the deal is. It's from Bowling Green, chartered 1949 for Walla Ella McKacky. And the totem is a Kodiak bear. So somewhere along the line, we move from bear to Kodiak bear. Now, what's a Kodiak? Hey, there's a Kodiak bear. A Kodiak bear is an Alaskan bear. An Alaskan bear that lives in the Kodiak archipelago in Southwest Alaska. Now, I know there are bears in Kentucky, but they're not Kodiak bears. So where does Kodiak bear come from? I don't know. And then it says absorbed by Wapiti Lodge 367. And again, changed the name in 1950. These are the other listings for Lodge 405. Up on top, we've got a, uh, a listing at the very top for a fake patch of a description I've never seen or pictured. And then we've got this. This is a fake of the R1. Interesting. Here's another fake of the R1. These are Asian embroidered. And here's a flat patch that's pending. 
for Lodge 405 Walla Elimakaki. And then down here, we have the listing EX 1951, the Mammoth Cave OA Conference Patch that was actually issued in 1951 by Lodge 405, but it's listed under Walla Elimakaki. Now we go to OA Lodge listings and let's breeze through this. What was going on? Every year, the OA put out a listing of what the lodges were in the, for the entire country. And so we'll look at some of these listings, the 1949 listing, 405, it shows Land of Big Caves in 1949 is the name of the lodge. This is according to the national OA listings. In 1950, Lodge 405 is known as Land of Big Caves in 1950. In 1950, there is what there is no listing for 1951, as as far as I know. In 1952, it's called Land of Big Caves, is the name of this lodge. In 1953, Lodge 405 drops out of the national listing; it's gone. In 53, now that would make sense because we knew it merged. And then the last of the national OA listings come from 1955. And we see that Lodge 405 is not part of the Area 4B listings for Kentucky. And so what we know is Land of Big Caves Lodge 405 did not change its name in 1950 or before it merged in 1952. It just didn't. We have the records to prove that it didn't. We also know merged lodges cannot change their name after they merge. So if they didn't change their name while they were still around, that was their name when they were gone. They can't change their name in 1954 or 1958 or 1963 or 2023. They're gone. Let's take a look at the OA and how the OA collectors listed these lodges. Starting in 1958, we have what became known as the Blue Book. Even though they called themselves the Lodge Listing, it was a blue book. And this was the first patch listing after the WAB book. Let's take a look inside. This is interesting for collectors. And when you take a look at the things that are shown and listed for patches, they had round, F for pocket flap, C for chenille, N for neckerchief, and X for any patch not listed above. You see any letters missing from here in 1958? How about S for solid? How about A for arrowhead? and so on. So the listing started out in the late 50s, pretty simple. And then when we get to the page with Lodge 405 on it, it's called Land of Big Caves Lodge, and it does not have any patches shown in 1958. No patches shown in 58. Then we move up here to the Trader Newsletter. For those of you that aren't familiar with this, back in the 50s and 60s, the first, the first thing to go out nationally was the Trader Newsletter, started by Mike Diamond. He started the Trader, and then this was turned over to E. Forrest Reynolds, and then later to David Lubitz. And this was, since we didn't have uh, Facebook and all the other stuff we have today, this was the way that male traders kept in touch with each other. And take a look at what is said. This is an article submitted in the Trader and it's by Hal Rudd, the biggest collector from a neighboring lodge, Lodge 123. And he says, a former chief of Lodge 405 said that Lodge, the Lodge 405 never issued a patch. It never issued a patch. And this is in 1958, six years after the lodge merged. But then he goes on to say the only patch they ever put out was for a conference. Now that doesn't seem to make sense. How can you never issue a patch and then the next sentence say that the only patch put out was for a conference? One of those two things has to be incorrect. Here's the answer. Back in those days, event patches were not considered to be lodge patches and they never got listed. And that's how you can say those two things in the same paragraph. He also, how Rudd also makes reference to another patch called Loletta Baden 405, and he says, it's not theirs. Not theirs, what does that mean? It doesn't belong to Lodge 405. 
here's the patch for the conference. And we know there was a patch for the conference. So that's a true statement. Here's Loletta Baden, Lodge 405. What's that? There it is right there, the Loletta Baden patch, 405. What is that? I, hadn't, I wasn't too familiar with this patch. I don't know where it came from. But apparently, it, back in the days when they wanted to collect a patch from each number and, the, and they didn't collect the event patches, this patch said 405 on it and collectors from the late 50s and early 60s picked up this patch. They would contact Hal, the expert from Kentucky, and they would say, is this the 405 I'm looking for for my number set? And he would tell them no. This is not it. We don't know exactly what this patch is, but back in the day, people wondered if it was from Lodge 405. The next issue of the Blue Book came out in 1963. Now they have more patches, A's, R's, F's, and S's became the thing also. W's, wovens, jacket patches. All of that stuff was developed between 1962 and 1963. Prior to that time, it didn't exist. Here we take a look at the listing in 1963 for Lodge 405, Land of Big Caves, and guess what? No patches. Nothing is listed in 1963. The 1964 Lodge listing is a yellow book, not a common copy. This one was put out not by Forrest Reynolds, but by Lou Crawford from Pennsylvania. Lou Crawford was one of the biggest collectors in the country. He put it out, he put out the book this year and he was from Lodge 441 and the two deer, male and female running deers and leaping deers were his Lodge totem. And suddenly we have a listing. In 1964, for the very first time, we have a listing from Elmer Hacky Khaki, whatever, Walla Lodge, and it shows they, they issued an R, an S, and an S. Well, we kind of know what the R is. The S and the S, I have no clue what that was. And that never, was never repeated in any other listing. I think it was a typo. One of the other things about it, this is the R, of course. And the other thing about it was that they had the name backwards. In 1964, they wrote the name from the patch the way you would read it by looking at a patch. You would read the top first, Elema McHackey, and then you would read Walla, and then you would read Lodge. And that's the way they wrote it in 1964, probably from looking at the patch. This was incorrect in terms of what came later. An article in the 1964 Trader talking about this Lodge. And the first thing in this article talks about that this was a mistake, that the real name was not as written in the book, but was this Walla, it started with Walla, Ella Mahaki. And they're talking about that for the first time in 1964, claiming it was an error by the supplier. We don't know if that's true or not, but guess what? A lodge issued 12 years after it merged, we have a name for that. It's called a private issue or it's called a Z. This is what we call these things now. And if we're being unkind, we call it a fake. No claim is ever made in this article that there ever was uh, anything other than a land of big caves lodge. I don't know where that name Walla Ella McKacky came from. I've looked it up. I've looked up Indian words. I've looked up old names for Mammoth Caves Park, what the Indians called it. Oh, I've looked up all kinds of things. That's not, I don't know. It's in some kind of invented word. It's not an Indian word or a group of Indian words. And at the, at the base of that article, the author says, this patch should not be recognized because it was issued by, wasn't issued by a real lodge. That, those are the facts. This came in 1980, uh, this came in 1964. We're talking 60, oh, 60 years ago. This information was out there when this patch was introduced. The following trader, the next issue, a month later, June of 1964, Hal Rudd issues or publishes a viewpoint. 
and it's worth reading for the second time in less than a year, letters from fellow questioning patches being offered from one of their members, all signs point to having not been issued by a lodge. And, he, and Hal wants to know what is going through people's minds when they're issuing these fake patches. And then he, then he follows up by saying, let's hope this sort of a thing comes to an end. And uh, anyone who knows about fakes to contact the trader and let them know about it as soon as possible. Of course, that never came to pass and um, we are where we are. So to wrap this thing up, there's some questions that need to be answered in my opinion, and I'll, I'll take a stab at them. Some of them are pure factual, others are my opinion based on the facts that we have. Did Land of Big Caves Lodge ever change its name? That's question number one. The answer in my opinion is no. There is no official documented evidence or contemporaneous newspaper articles that say it changed its name in 1950 or any time before it merged in 1952. Next question, <clears throat> can a lodge change its name if it is unchartered, has merged, or by past members? And the answer is no. <laughs> a lodge can't change its name after it's on. Past members can't change the name of a lodge. <laughs> no. That doesn't happen. Well, what does that make then of Walla Ella Makaki Lodge? What's that? And it's my opinion based on the evidence that that is a bogus lodge name for a lodge that did not exist. It first appeared in 1964, 12 years after Land of Big Caves Lodge merged. The lodge name should still be listed, but with a notation. In my opinion, no documentation lodge name ever existed. If there was no lodge, Walla Ella Makaki Lodge 405, how could there be a patch for a lodge that didn't exist? In my opinion, it makes this patch a Z. It first appeared in 1964 and it rightly belongs to be listed as a 405 ZR1 from Land of Big Caves Lodge 405. Interestingly, the first Arapaho II in 1978 correctly called this a Z in the listing, but they called it a Z and listed it with the bogus lodge name, Walla Ella Makaki Lodge and not Land of Big Caves. Well, what does that make of all these fakes? that are listed with 405. To me, it makes the fakes of this patch to be fakes of a fake. <laughs> and that's a new one on the hobby, fakes of a fake. All of them should still be listed as fakes, but underneath land of big cave lodges. So what then is this patch? Well, in my view, this patch is the only genuine patch ever issued by Land of Big Caves Lodge and the only real patch to have from Lodge 405 in an OA number set. It is correctly listed as 405 EX 1951, but it's incorrectly listed under Walla Elema Mikaki Lodge. It should be listed under Land of Big Caves Lodge as the only lodge listing. And finally, what's this? Well, it's not an OA patch, but it is a real BSA patch. I just don't know where it's from or what it was for. This patch was circulating in the early days of the OA number collecting and collectors prior to 1964 would ask Cal Rudd if this was a 405. The real 405 patch, EX 1951, was not considered at the time to be a lodge emblem because event patches were never listed. Because it was once considered to be a possible Lodge 405 patch in the 1950s or 60s, it could be listed under Land of Big Caves Lodge. It is not a Z though, because it is a real patch. So maybe the listing could be 405 YR1 with an appropriate comment in the description. And there you have an unknown patch tale about Lodge 405. <laughs>